Thousand Pine Points. Humble Thinker. He was first. But the first shall be last. Sorry, Derek. Humble Thinker beat you. I was feeling, uh, feeling a little nostalgic tonight. So I wanted to watch uh, William Lane Craig versus Christopher Hitchens. And I thought, hey, why not uh, watch it together? Uh, and it's a good quality video. So that's what we'll do. And also, uh, in about, hopefully in under an hour, maybe 45 minutes by the time we're done with this fun, Cam Spires will join me and we will talk about the results of a critical thinking survey that um, he came up with and uh, I helped a little bit and we distributed it uh, to many Facebook groups in various social media platforms. It was three critical thinking questions and, um, and then the fourth question was a demographic question. If you're a Christian atheist, Muslim, Hindu. Uh, and we had responses from almost, I think, every category. Um, from Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, other. So, yeah, it's, uh, so we'll, we'll post the results. Which demographic won? <laughs> I'll, I'll warn you, the results are pretty disappointing. It, did anybody in the chat see this uh, critical uh, thinking survey that that Cam put out? If not, let's see. Where is it? I wonder if I can put it in the... Because uh... maybe you want to take it, and if you think you're smart, you can take this test, and if you don't do well, then it's a, I've provided you a, a, a way to, to keep humble. Let's see here if I can find it. Actually, you know what? We'll wait until... Um, because I don't want you to spend the whole time. I want you to listen to Hitchens and William Lane Craig here. So how are you guys doing tonight? John Marcus, good to see you here. I appreciate you uh, being here because I, I think you're a Christian who thinks I'm lost, right? So it's good to see you listening to a lost person. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're not the John Marcus I'm thinking of. Or maybe I'm mixing up names. Please share, Doug. Yeah, okay. Let me get it from Cam instead of me trying to find it here and then I'll post it what I'll do is I'll put it in the uh, I think I can do this on the fly I'll put it in the description box uh, and then you guys it will take you to a page and you it's three questions I think some of you can finish it in like in 60 seconds some of you might take uh, 10 minutes, I don't know. Cam, can you link me the survey? The actual questions. Again, por favor. Okay, as soon as Cam does that, I will uh, put it in the box, description box. Or maybe I can put it right in the live stream chat since I... And the owner of this channel. You are a Christian, but you're in the middle. Oh, what does that mean, John Marcus? What does that mean? You're in the middle. Are you a, are you a lukewarm fence sitting Christian that Yahweh wants to spit out? <laughs> How was my birthday? My birthday was good. I asked. Remember, a long time ago, I asked for blue headphones, and I got them. However, they were the wrong ones. And it's my fault because I said it to my wife I wanted wireless, but then I forgot my desktop doesn't have Bluetooth and I don't want to have to download it and all that. I'm just going to get wires. I actually prefer wires when it comes to computers. Oh, good. So Cam put it, the, the link in there. So click on that link. And uh, while you are taking that test, I'm going to listen to Christopher Hitchens and William Lane Craig. By the way, this happened on April 4th, 2009. 
it, this is a long debate. So I'm, I started it uh, around 60% when they have like the five minute each rebuttals and then they question each other and then Q and A. So uh, there's no way I'm going to try to listen to the whole thing. I think it's, it's, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, it's Tertullian, isn't it, who says something like, it's, it's variously translated, credo queer absurdum, that the, the, the very improbability of the thing, the very unlikelihood of it, the unlikelihood that anyone would fabricate such a thing, for example, that, that, that a Jew could be brought to believe something so extraordinary, uh, is testimony to its truth. I, I'm, I'm sure there can't be anyone here who doesn't think that's a little too easy a little too facile. I myself, for example, have followed the career of a woman known vulgarly in the media um, as Mother Teresa, um, an Albanian uh, named Agnes Bojashu, a ca Catholic fanatic operating in the greater Calcutta area. And I watched every stage of her career uh, as, a, as a candidate for, and then, then a, the recipient of, beatification and uh, shortly canonization. The canonization will, re will require uh, and uh, as the Vatican demands, um, the attestation of a miracle performed by her posthumous intercession. And the miracle's already been announced, a woman in Bengal, fortunately already a devout Catholic, by pressing a medal of Mother Teresa to her stomach, made a tumor go away, or so she says. Um, all the witnesses to this have since recanted. All the doctors have given a much better explanation of how she was cured of the swelling and the growth and what the medicines were and so forth, but they're still stuck with it. They have to go ahead with this process because, which will lead to countless untold suffering in India because it will appear to license the, the bogus uh, charlatanry of shaman medicine and, and uh, intercessory medicine rather than the real thing. All of this will have to be gone through, this awful display uh, in the name. This actually relates to the, the critical thinking survey that Cam did because as, as Hitchens is describing is, you know, what is more likely that uh, Mother Teresa did these miracles or that there's another explanation? And it could be true that these miracles actually happened. But what kind of evidence would you need to overcome that improbability? And this is what these critical thinking questions get at and why people like me and Cam, for example, think the evidence... Uh, for the resurrection of Jesus is um, far, far from being even close to being sufficient uh, to be believed. In, in the name of faith, and I just happen to have watched it at every stage, and I can tell you, it's, it's depressingly easy to get a religious rumor started. You can count on an enormous amount of pre-existing credulity among illiterate, frightened, ill-educated Populations. There isn't a literate, written down, properly, properly attested witness of any real sort uh, in, in the Gospels. It, it this is a huge point, and this is a challenge I've issued to Christians many times, and they don't like it. And the challenge is, name one person who identifies himself in the first person, takes a pen, and writes, I saw the risen Jesus. And in the New Testament... If you're a Christian listening, believe it or not, there's only one person who actually takes a pen, writes in the first person themselves, and says, hey, I saw Jesus uh, risen from the dead, that he appeared to me. And that is Paul. And Paul even admits this is through visions. Everything he knows about Jesus is through visions and revelation. The Gospels don't count as any first-person eyewitness testimony. Now, Christians can say, blah, 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 but that, but, 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 that's not how they did it back then, but, but the fact still remains, what I said is true. First Peter is probably the closest you'll get, but even then, Peter, if he wrote First Peter, um, says that he was a witness to the sufferings of Christ, but he actually doesn't say that he witnessed the, the um, bodily resurrection of Jesus. It is, and you may as well admit it, and stick to it, because it's what you're good at, it involves an act of faith. Second, on the matter of my moral question. Yes, it's true that Doug Wilson said that tithing was something I couldn't do, but then, not just to, I'm not moving the goalposts here, I don't think I'd regard giving all my money to the new St. Andrew's Church as a moral act. Um, the, only, the only challenge that I've had so far that I really couldn't get out of, I, I should share it with you, was I was told, well, you couldn't do this. You couldn't say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. No, but nor could you, as people of faith. You wouldn't dare. It would be blasphemy for you to do it. There's only one person who can do that 
even on your account. So with respect, ladies and gentlemen, I think both my challenges stand. It hasn't been shown that I couldn't be a moral person despite my unbelief, and it has certainly not been demonstrated that unbelief will, will guarantee you against, um, uh, excuse me, the, the belief will, um, <clears throat> I'll say it again, that unbelief uh, will ensure you against wickedness. Um, you mentioned things like apartheid and Nazism. Well, let me just run it uh, by you. Partly this often comes up because people say, what about the crimes and wickednesses of... By the way, if you're taking the uh, survey, uh, feel free. But uh, I just let you know, I think we're almost to a thousand um, results, a thousand people taking the survey. So we're just under. So if you can, hey, thank you very much, Diane. I really appreciate the, do the donation. Appreciate the fact you're from Canada, my, my home country. Um, if if uh, everybody in here watching, if they haven't, and they if they take the uh, the critical surveys that's in, it's linked up, so you might have to scroll up to find the link. Uh, maybe we can get to 1,000 tonight. Of the secular world, the apartheid system in South Africa was actually a creation of the Dutch Reformed Church. It was justified theologically as the giving of a promised land to one Christian religious tribe in which everyone else was supposed to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. It wasn't until the Dutch Reformed Church, under pressure, agreed to drop their racist preachments of many years that the apartheid system could be dismantled. The dictatorship in Greece in 1967 to 74 was proclaimed by the Greek Orthodox Church as a Greece for Christian Greeks. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church at present, maybe this is one of the churches you don't recognize as Christian, I don't know, but it's currently become the bodyguard of the Vladimir Putin dictatorship in Russia. They're, they are now producing, the Russian Orthodox Church, actual icons with halos around them of Joseph Stalin for distribution to extreme Russian nationalists and chauvinists for whom the church has become uh, the spiritual sword um, and buckler. In um, Nazi Germany, prayers were said every year on the Fuhrer's birthday by order of the churches uh, for, for his survival and well-being. The first uh, concordat signed by Hitler and by Mussolini in, in both cases was with uh, the Vatican. Uh, if you take out the word um, fascist from any uh, account of the 1920s and 30s, any reputable historical account, and you insert the words Christian right wing or actually Catholic right wing, you don't have to change a word of the rest of the sentence. And the third member of the Axis, the Japanese Empire, was led by someone who actually claimed he was himself a god and to whom everyone in Japan was a serf and had to admit his godhead and divinity. And it was said to all of them. The reason why Hitchens is going into the morality is because just before this, uh, the issue of morality came up uh, between the two. And uh, so that's why he's talking about, you know, just because you believe in a deity doesn't guarantee you by any means that you're going to behave towards your fellow man in a good way. And just because you don't believe in a, a deity doesn't mean you'll behave towards your fellow man in a cruel way. Where would we know without the emperor? How would we know what to do? How would we know what a right action was? Without him, there would be screwing in the streets. Uh, there would be chaos. No one would know their bearings. Without our God, we would be rudderless. Many Japanese people, in fact, to the, it's, it, it's pitiful to report, still actually uh, believe that. Now, um, I want to say, in other words, that religion is the outcome of unresolved contradictions in the material world that if you make the assumption that it's man-made, uh, then very few things are mysterious to you. If you make the assumption that religion is man-made, then, then you would know why, it would be obvious to you why, there are so many religions. Um, when you make the assumption that it's man-made, you will understand why it is that religion has been such a disappointment to our species, that despite innumerable revivals, um, innumerable attempts again to preach the truth, innumerable attempts to convert the heathen, innumerable attempts to send missionaries all around the world, that the same problems remain with us, that nothing is resolved by this, that we, we, if, the, if all religions died out... I've noticed a lot of people are talking about their favorite Hitchens uh, debates. I like this one because I think it is a great example of how to handle a person who um, I think a lot of people believe is refined and well-read and uh, philosophically adept, uh, how you handle a person like William Lane Craig. And Hitchens does it beautifully here, and you'll see it coming up. Or 
all were admitted to be false, instead of, as all believers will tell you, only some of them are false. In other words, we're faced with the preposterous proposition that religion, uh, either all of them true, or none of them true, or only one exclusive preachment is true. And none of these seem to me coherent, and all of these seem to be the outcome of a man-made cult, assumed that all of them were discredited at the same time, all of our problems would be exactly what they are now. How do we live with one another? Where indeed do morals and ethics come from? What are our duties to one another? How shall we build the just city? How shall we practice love? Uh, how, shall we, how shall we deal with the, the baser, uh, what Darwin called the, 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 the lowly stamp of our original origins, which comes uh, not from a, a pact with the devil or an original sin, but from our evolution as well. All these questions, ladies and gentlemen, would remain exactly the same. Emancipate yourself from the idea of a celestial dictatorship, and you've taken the first step to becoming free. Thank you. Dr. Craig, you're... But I want to point out that uh, Christianity is not about being free. In fact, it's about being a slave, a slave to Christ. Closing argument, five minutes. In my final speech, I'd like to try to draw together some of the threads of this debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, have we seen any good arguments tonight to think that God does not exist? No, I don't think we have. We've heard attacks upon religion. Uh, this is an important point, uh, and I am a little sympathetic to this point. William Lane Craig is we haven't heard any arguments uh, to demonstrate or prove that um, God does not exist. So you have to remember the null hypothesis to, for a theist is that God exists, and you have to prove that he doesn't. So you really have to understand that is their null hypothesis. Whereas to a non-believer, the null hypothesis is um, no gods exist until you can demonstrate or prove otherwise. And so it's, a, you know, completely two different null hypotheses going on here. Uh, Christianity impugned, uh, God impugned, Mother Teresa impugned, but we haven't heard any arguments that God does not exist. Um, Mr. Hitchens seems to fail to recognize that atheism is itself a worldview. And it claims alone to be true, and all the other religions of the world false. It is no more tolerant than Christianity with respect to these other views. He That's not the case for me, William Lake Craig. I basically say that I don't live my life like it's true. It could be true. I doubt it. I don't think it is. I don't, um, but I don't say that there can't be a God. Now, William Lane Craig would probably call me an agnostic at that point, but I call myself an atheist because I don't believe in any gods asserts that he alone has the true worldview, atheism. The only problem is he doesn't have any arguments for this worldview. He I made a video a while back saying there are no good arguments for atheism, and I actually think that's, uh, do I dare say, a clever way of, of talking to a theist. I've, I've written that in many Facebook groups, in many live streams, Christian live streams, and they know, they see Pine Creek's name, they go, oh, Pine Creek is here, they recognize the name, they recognize the channel, and I'll say, right in a Christian live stream, there are no good arguments for, and I capitalize F-O-R, for atheism. And, um, and they kind of, they're taken aback, like, whoa, he, he admits that? But once you realize that, once you see that there's no good arguments for theism, the, you're left with that default position of not believing, of atheism, in this at least soft atheism. Just asserts it. So it seems to me that we, if you're going to have a worldview and champion it tonight, you've got to come to a debate prepared to give some arguments, and we haven't heard any. He did have an argument about evolution, but when I explained that, it actually turned out to be supportive of theism. Evolution actually provides evidence for the existence of a designer of the universe. So we've not heard any good arguments to think that atheism is true. What would an undesigned universe look like, William Lane Craig? True. Now, I presented five reasons to think that theism is true. And this is what God, or the God hypothesis, does give you. He asks, what does it give us? It explains a broad range of human experience, philosophical, ethical, 
uh, scientific, historical, experiential. I find the attraction of the God hypothesis is that it uh, is so powerful in making sense of the way the world is. For example, the God hypothesis explains the origin of the universe. Mr. Hitchens is com I just did a video. Uh, okay, this is two, this video was made in 2009, and I showed a video, I don't know when that was, two weeks ago, one week ago, where William Lane Craig uses uh, the deflationary theory of the universe to, for some reason, to help him believe in the second coming of Jesus. Don't ask me to explain it. But I, I have him on record saying that our universe could create a new universe. So if we are, let's assume we're in that new universe and and saying, where did this universe come from? We're looking around, where, how did it all start? Well, from a prior universe. And so at least from the perspective of our universe, it could have been created by another universe that precedes it in quotes. And so therefore what William Lane Craig, as, at least from the perspective of our universe, no God required. Completely dropped this point in tonight's debate when we saw that in fact scientific and philosophical evidence points to a beginning of the universe out of nothing and therefore to a transcendent personal creator of the cosmos. The teleological argument, the fine-tuning that is established in the initial condition. I've seen a lot of fine-tuning arguments. For me, the best way to, um, to talk about the fine-tuning argument is in one sentence, and that's basically, look, the fine-tuning argument is an argument for God, correct? And the theist says, yes, Doug, yes. I say, okay, so you're saying that God, you know, symbolically fine-tuned all the dials for life, correct? Yes, Doug, that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's about right. Are you saying God is now limited, that he couldn't have made the dials anything and still created life? Are you saying God doesn't have the ability to do that? Oh, no, no, God, God can do... It falls right apart. As soon as you admit that, uh, it's very hard for a Christian to admit that God is limited to certain physical constants in order to create life. And if he's not limited, if he can do any physical constants and still create life like us, then the f whole fine-tuning argument just fizzles. ...of the universe, not to speak of in the biological complexity that then ensued. And again, Mr. Hitchens has dropped that in the course of the debate tonight. So we have a creator and an intelligent designer of the cosmos. Thirdly, the moral argument. We saw that without God, there are no objective moral values. Now, what William Lane Craig means by objective is God morals. Because William Lane Craig is on record. I have this on another video where he basically says that if there is no God, there is no objective morality, and that his God, not just any God, but his God is the source for that morality. That's what he believes. So not, you know, not the Allah God not the Vishnu God, it's his God that's the source of morality. So this just makes, it's, it's, it's almost a tautology. He's saying that without his God, there's no God morals. That just makes sense, of course. If, his, if you're defining objective morality as the morality that flows from the nature of his God, then if his God doesn't exist, then those morals don't exist. But it, it almost reduces down to silliness because... I don't think William Lane Craig would feel too comfortable having his whole moral argument viewed that way. Without God, there is no God morals. And here Mr. Hitchens has consistently distorted the argument. He's portrayed the argument as how would we know moral values if we didn't believe in God? We don't need to believe in a tyrant in order to find moral values. Unbelief doesn't produce wickedness. That is all irrelevant. The point is that there is no foundation on a naturalistic worldview for the moral values and duties that we both want to affirm. And he agrees with that. This is what he says, and I quote. He says, our innate predisposition to both good and wicked behavior is precisely what one would expect to find of a recently evolved species that is half a chromosome away from chimpanzees. By the way, I think uh, the older I get, the more I talk to theists over the years, the more I think I should use other animals as examples when talking about morality because you will see i think there's people even listening to this right now who have dogs pet dogs who feel guilt 
Like, <laughs> you, you talk to them harshly when they just rip up your rug, and you can see them sheepishly crawl. Like, animals can feel, in quotes, guilt. They can, um, what we would call help, care for other dogs and even humans. Chimpanzees and elephants and other higher mammals, they can do what at least looks like empathy and love and caring. What if we humans are the same way, Christians? What if we just exhibit the same behaviors as these other animals? And we just, because of our vocal cords, we verbalize it as love, empathy, and all these things. Primate and elephant and even pig societies show considerable evidence of care for others, parent-child bonding, solidarity in the face of danger, and so on. As Darwin put it, any animal whatever endowed with well-marked social instincts would inevitably acquire a moral sense or conscience as soon as its intellectual powers had become as well-developed as in man. That is the socio... Uh, it's too bad that William Lane Craig is losing his voice here. It's kind of hard to listen to. ...biological explanation of morality. The problem is that that moral sense that develops in pig societies, chimpanzees, baboons, and homo sapiens is illusory on atheism because there are no objective moral duties or values that we have to fulfill, and that's what the theist... This is one thing I don't figure out, uh, I can't figure out. Just because a god commands something, that still doesn't get you to the ought position. Like, why ought one obey God? Like, from a Christian perspective, the only thing they can say at that point is, well, it's because you ought to by definition, because he's the creator. They, they can say, for any answer they give, you can just say, so what? So what if he created everything? Like, if you can imagine that an evil god, would you obey that one? No, no, Doug. But if they're, that's uh, unrealistic hypothetical. You cannot get to a knot even with a, with a creator deity who commands things. The, and then the second best answer they can give, I guess, besides by definition you ought to do it, is, well, he can roast you forever in eternal damnation. And that's really painful, Doug. That's probably actually the better answer. This can offer Mr. Hitchens. And so I want to invite Mr. Hitchens to think about becoming a Christian tonight. Uh, <laughs> All of <laughs> honestly, it, honestly, if if he is a man of goodwill who will follow the evidence where it leads, all of the evidence tonight has been on one side of the scale, and he wants to affirm objective moral values. So why not adopt theism? The resurrection of Jesus has gone unrefuted. If the argument is. I got to hear that again. Theism, the resurrection of Jesus has gone unrefuted. Hmm. Did you guys hear that? It's unrefuted. I guess it's over. The argument is not that it's too improbable to be false. The argument is that you need a historically sufficient explanation to explain why the disciples came to believe this. And you need, you need an explanation. And there isn't one apart from the empty tomb and appearances. Yeah, it's, it's clear. It's, there was an empty tomb. Uh, people saw that the tomb was empty. There was appearances of Jesus to other people. Case closed. Like, I don't understand why anybody would question that. But you see the problem here, William Lane Craig, is if you're going to believe those reports in the Bible, in the Gospels, for example, then why even debate? Why even delve into the evidence. Just read the part where it says Jesus rose from the dead and you're done. In fact, you don't even need to hear about the witnesses. You don't even need to hear about empty tombs. Just read the part where it says uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus rose from the dead and you're done. But if you're willing to doubt that, then you're willing to doubt those resurrection appearances and that there even was a tomb and so forth. I, I, I think this is something a lot of Christians don't get that if you're going to believe every claim in the Bible, every claim in the Gospels, then really you don't even need, need to talk about any of this evidence in the first place, if you're just going to accept all of it as true. But once, once you get yourself to say or to question that maybe this verse didn't actually happen in the past, then you're going to start questioning that verse 
and then that verse, and then that verse. And before you know it, you're going to say, hmm, maybe there were no resurrection appearances in the flesh. It's not a matter of rumor because the empty tomb was public knowledge in Jerusalem. It would be impossible for Christianity to flourish in Jerusalem in the face of an occupied tomb. That's just so false for so many reasons. Christianity was like a no-name, nothing religion when it first started. Nobody cared about it. And by the time people started writing the Gospels about it, probably in Rome or Greece, um, this was a lifetime after, and anybody who could have said otherwise was probably dead and were a thousand miles away. Finally, the immediate experience of God. If there's anybody watching or listening to the debate tonight who hasn't found God in a personal experiential way, then I want to invite you as well to think about becoming a Christian. I became a Christian as a junior in high school, and it changed my entire life. And I believe that if you'll look into it honestly with an open mind and an open heart, that it can change your life as well. Okay, I want you to listen to that again. And uh, especially if you're a Christian, I want you to imagine William Lane Craig as a Mormon. So William Lane Craig is now a Mormon. Watching or listening to the debate tonight, who hasn't found God in a personal experiential way, then I want to invite you as well to think about becoming a Christian. I became a Christian as a junior in high school, and it changed my entire life. And I believe that if you'll look into it honestly with an open mind and an open heart, that it can change your life as well. An open mind and an open heart, it will change your life as well. Hey, thank you, D.B. Cisco. Penance for being late. You're forgiven, my son. Go in peace. <laughs> I just did a Catholic thing. I don't know, I don't know why. Um, Mormons say the exact same thing. If you only pray to God, if you have an open mind, open heart, you'll see the Book of Mormon as being true. And so he... William Lane Craig, throughout this whole debate, talks about all the evidence and quotes for the resurrection and for God. But at the end, his, he, he did this for a reason. His bottom, his last statement, his bottom line is, I want you to become a Christian. Just please have an open mind, open heart. If you haven't, he mentioned his personal experience. If you haven't had an experience of Jesus, just have an open mind, open heart. And I hope you come to see this as true. Because this is how he became a Christian. This is how William Lane, William Lane Craig became a Christian. It was th through that existential angst that there has to be more to, the, to life than just living and then dying, and that's it. And that really bothered him, and so that got him on the trail to Christianity. Mr. Hitchens has yielded his time, and therefore we move to question. That was a brilliant move, actually, that William Ling, uh, sorry, that Hitchens yielded his time here. And we are directing those questions to students tonight. I want to repeat something Dr. Hazen said. There are stupid questions. <laughs> I want to add to it, we are uninterested in your opinions. Only your questions matter to us. I don't know where the microphone is. Can we hear the first question? Each participant will answer every question. Dr. Craig, Mr. Hitchens, thank you so much. It's been great listening to you both. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hitchens. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, in your book, God is Not Great, you say that, quote, there are four irreducible objections to religious faith, end quote. The third being that religious faith, quote, is both the result and the cause of dangerous sexual oppression. Never. I'm so glad there's no evidence that this is true. Thank you. Okay, th that was the Q&A. I'm going to back it up to the, the cross-examination part. That was more interesting. We now enter the uh, period of cross-examination, which trial-like allows the questioner to pose and the answer only to answer and not to repeat the question or to dodge. Six minutes of questions begin to Dr. Craig, followed by six, question, six minutes of questions to Mr. Hitchens. Dr. Craig, your questions for Mr. Hitchens. All right, let's talk first about whether there are any good arguments to think that atheism is true. Now, it seems to me that you're rather ambivalent here that you say, you, you, you redefine atheism 
to mean a sort of atheism or non-theism. That's, that's what it means. Um, but how do you distinguish then the different varieties of non-theism? For example, what is normally called atheism, agnosticism, or the view of verificationists that uh, the statement God exists is simply meaningless. Well, I mean, there are different schools of atheism, as you say, but the, the, there's, no, there's no claim I know how to make that says atheism is true, because atheism is the statement that a certain proposition isn't true. So uh, I wish you'd get this bit right, um, because I'm, it's there you go again. Well, I, 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 I just... Um, I can sort of understand why theists and Christians in this case are so perturbed about this, and it's because they feel like they're always doing all the work, all the heavy lifting. It's like they're always having to defend, 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 defend. And all the atheists can say is, uh, I'm not convinced it's true. And, um, and so a part of me empathizes with the Christian here. And, but I do think it is since the... Con and here's another problem. The whole concept of God from the Christian point of view is just so clear. It's like, oh, this is what God is. This is who God is. But when you look at the whole world, there's so many definitions of God. It's some of which people like me don't are not even aware of. How can we have a positive disbelief in something we're not even aware of? So the whole point about soft atheism, whatever you want to call it, is that... Um, I just don't believe any gods exist. Now, I will take the positive disbelief stance on things that I've investigated, like Christianity, and I'll give evidence why I think it is not to be believed or that the evidence is terrible and so forth. So I will kind of help the Christian a little bit and say, I will take a little bit of burden. I'm willing to do that. Now, I'm not saying all atheists need to do that, but I'm saying I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to take the burden that Christianity is probably false. But I'm not omniscient. I could be wrong. I devoted a little time to this. I said, it, it's a, it is not in itself a belief or a system. It simply says you can get by uh, better, probably, we think, um, without the assumption that no one who wants you to worship a god has ever been able to come up with a good enough reason to make you do it. Uh, now, so, so the, the point is, though, that on your definition of, of uh, atheism or non-theism, it really embodies a diversity of views such as agnosticism, what is normally called atheism, or this uh, verificationism. Now, which of those do you hold to within this umbrella of atheism? Are you uh, an atheist who asserts the proposition God does not exist, or do you simply withhold belief in God in the way the agnostic does? Right. I'm a, I, in some, on some days, um, I'm a great, I'm a, no, I'm not gonna, no, I'm not gonna do you that much of a favor. Um, on, some, on some days, I'm a great admirer of Thomas Huxley, who had the great, uh, who, who had the great debate with Bishop Wilberforce um, in Oxford, at the Natural History Museum about Darwinism um, in the mid uh, 19th century, and who was known as Darwin's bulldog. We would now say Darwin's pit bull, um, and who completely trounced the good bishop. Um, but I can't thank him for inventing the term agnostic. And I can't thank him for some of his social Darwinist positions either, which are some of which are rather now, unattractive. I need an answer to this. Unattractive, My time yeah. is but because because I, think, I think agnosticism is evasive. To me, yes, if you, if you talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and so forth, to me, that is meaningless. It's, it's to me, I'm sorry, I've tried. It's white noise. It's like saying there is only one God and Allah is his messenger. It's gibberish to me. The, what, there, what are, there, are many, there are many of us, I'm sorry, there are just many of us who, to whom, the, of whom this is the case. Uh, it may be true, it is true. Okay, the Mr. Religion, Hitchens, I, I yeah. gotta press you here, again, because oh, uh, time is leaving. Feel free. What, what is your view, exactly? Press away. Do you, do, do you affirm God does not I think exist, once, or I think, do you simply I think once, I, I think once I have said that I've never seen any persuasive evidence for the existence of something, and I've made real attempts to study the evidence presented and the arguments presented, that I will, I will go as far as to say have the nerve to say uh, that it does not therefore exist, except in the minds right. of its, so, except, except in the, uh, the uh, Henry Jamesian uh, subjective sense that you say of it being in, so real 
to some people in their own minds, that All right, it, yeah, that that counts as a force in the world, yes. Okay, so you, you do affirm then that God does not exist. Now, what I want to know, and do you have any justification for that? I think I've, I've come unwired oh, in some horrible still, way. Oh, you're fine. Are you sure? Do, do you have any, any arguments leading to the conclusion that God does not exist? Well, I would rather, I think, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm boring anybody now. I would rather, I would rather say, uh, I'd rather state it in reverse and say, I, I find all the arguments in favor to be fallacious or unconvincing. And I'd have to add that though this isn't my reason for not believing in it, that I would be very depressed if it was true. But that's a quite different thing. I, I, don't, I, I don't say of atheism that it's at all morally superior, that would be very risky. I wouldn't admit that it was at all morally inferior either, but we can at least be acquitted on the charge of wishful thinking. I wonder, I wonder if that's the case. Would you agree that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence? Well, you know, I'm not sure that I would agree. Yeah, that, I wouldn't agree either. That is, you, you hear, I, I don't know why, it's mostly Christians who say that, that the um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In cases where you expect to see evidence and you don't, of course that's evidence. Uh, popular example is a claim, um, there's a dead man in my trunk. That's a truth claim, right? There is either, there's either a dead man in my trunk or there isn't. So what evidence would you expect to see if you wanted to investigate that claim? That there'd be a dead man in my trunk. So we go to my trunk, we open it up, no dead man. That's evidence of absence and pretty strong evidence that the claim is false. Okay. Let's turn no, to the I moral mean, argument I, I and talk about that a little bit. I think you've, under, you've misunderstood the moral argument. When given, you, I mean, given the stakes, Doctor, sorry. Given the stakes, I mean, you're not saying, we're not talking about unicorns or tooth fairies or leprechauns here. We're talking about uh, an authority that would give other human beings the right to tell me what to do in the name of God. So for, for a claim like that, if there's no evidence for it, um, it seems to me a, a very, a, 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 not, a, not a small question. No, um, it's certainly not a small question. But you're I making a very, very, very large claim. Your evidence had better be absolutely magnificent, it seems to me. And it's the lack of mag... This, this is the key point and why I, I'm linking this video in with Cam's critical thinking survey. It's such a, an amazing claim that your evidence has to overcome it in order to be believed, to be sufficient, at least in my epistemology and um, Cam's. Magnificence, I think, that began to strike me first. One final question, Doctor. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to the moral argument. It seems to me there that you've misunderstood the argument in that we're looking for an objective foundation for the moral values and duties that we, want, we both, I think, want to affirm. It's not a matter of whether or not we can know what is right and wrong or that we need God to tell us what is right and wrong. It's rather that we need to have some sort of an objective foundation for right and wrong. Wouldn't you agree on your view, it's simply the sociobiological spin-offs of the evolutionary process and that therefore these do not provide any sort of objective foundation for moral values and duties. Uh, that, that could be true, yes. That okay. could well be true. Yeah, I don't want to be too much of a reductionist, but it's, it's, in, it's entirely possible that it is purely... Yeah, and my advice is if you're talking to a person like William Lane Craig, you say, yeah, you're exactly right. If there is no God, there's no God morals. Because remember, people like William Lane Craig believe that the only, only, only source for objective morality is his God. He doesn't think you can get objective morality from Vishnu. No way does he believe that, that it's only from the outflowing of his God's nature. So of course, it's just, that's just science that if his God doesn't exist, there is no God morals. Very evolutionary and functional. One wants to think that there's a bit more to one's love for the fellow creature than that. But it's, it's, it doesn't add one iota of weight or, or moral gravity to the argument to say, but, but that's because I don't believe in a supernatural being. It just, it's a non sequitur. Mr. Hitchens, your question is for Dr. Craig. Ah, well, um, I'd like to know first. Okay, now what Hitchens does here is priceless, because remember, Dr. W uh, William Lane Craig, sophisticated, f uh, well-read philosophically, knows all the arguments for God, and watch how Hitchens handles that. Because, and 
I must admit that I've used the same strategy because it kind of, well, you'll see. You said um, that the, the career of Jesus of Nazareth involved a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. When you say exorcism, do you mean that you believe in devils too? What I meant there was that most historians agree that Jesus of Nazareth practiced miracle working and he practiced exorcisms. I'm not committing myself nor are historians committing themselves to the reality of demons, but they are saying that Jesus uh, did practice exorcism. And now, Notice, he said historians are not committing themselves to the existence of demons, which also means, I think, that historians don't commit themselves to the existence of angels, or that historians don't commit themselves to the existence of any spiritual beings. He practiced uh, uh, healing. So you believe that uh, Jesus of Nazareth caused devils to leave the body of a madman and go into a flock of pigs that hurled themselves down the Gadarene slopes into the sea? Do I believe that is, that's historical? Yes. Right. That would be source. He believes that it's historical, even though he just said that uh, historians can't, you know, by the historical method say that this happened. He believes that demons came out of a person and went into a flock of pigs. The well-read, philosophically-minded William Lane Craig. Sorry, wouldn't it, though? No, it would be an illustration of Jesus' ability to command even the forces of darkness, and therefore an illustration of the sort of divine authority that he was able to command and exercise. This, as I say, is illustrative of this unprecedented sense of divine authority that Jesus of Nazareth had, that he even could command the forces of darkness and, and that they would obey. So whether you think... Forces of darkness. Here we have a PhD talking Star Wars language. <laughs> he was a genuine exorcist or that he merely believed himself to be an exorcist. What is historically undeniable is that he had this radical sense of divine authority, which he expressed by miracle working and exorcisms. Right. And do you, and you believe he was, he was born of a virgin? Um, I, yes, I believe that as a Christian. I couldn't claim to prove that historically. That's not part of my case tonight. You can't prove the uh, virginity of Mary, William Lane Craig, but you can prove the resurrection? Is that what you're saying? Is that what I'm hearing? But I, 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 as a Christian, I believe that. And I know you believe in the resurrection, but... Yes, as a matter of as a matter of biblical... What oh, I, uh, Hitchens talked over William Lane Craig there, but what he said was important. Let me see if I can hear it. In the resurrection, but... Yes, as a matter of Oh, you notice he said that I think has better evidence. And I'm not sure if he said the word better. But he's saying, William Lane Craig is saying, I, I cannot demonstrate historically uh, about the virgin birth, but the resurrection I can. I, I find that very interesting. Biblical, what should we call it? Um, consistency. Um, it's said in one of the Gospels that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves of Jerusalem were opened. And all the tenants of the graves walked the streets and greeted their old friends. It makes resurrection sound rather a commonplace in the greater Jerusalem area. It's a, it, that's in the Gospel of Matthew, and that's actually attached to a crucifixion narrative. That's where, what it said. It says at the time of the crucifixion. That's yes, correct. that's right. At the time of the crucifixion, it says that there were appearances of Old Testament saints in Jerusalem at the time. This is part of Matthew's uh, description of the crucifixion scene. Do, I mean, do you believe that? I don't know whether Matthew intends this to be apocalyptic imagery or whether he means this to be taken literally. I'm, I've not studied it in any depth and I'm open-minded about it. I'm you haven't studied this in any depth, but yet you've studied the resurrection in depth? That's interesting, William Lane Craig. Like, think about what William Lane Craig's saying here. He's saying this could be some type of imagery that the tombs were opened and, and the dead uh, came out of their graves, but he doesn't stop to consider that maybe the bodily resurrection is some type of imagery, some type of story, to give some maybe moral message or religious message of some sort? Why does he not accept that claim that the dead came out of the graves, but he does accept that there was resurrection appearances? Maybe just because there's more independent sources and it only Matthew says it? And if, if so, that he's starting to use the historical method, but then you got the problem of the synoptics are, are not independent, at least mostly not, 
and that they all borrow from each other. We don't know who wrote them. They don't critique their own or state their own sources. Like the whole, his, if he's going to go down the historical method road, he has to be prepared for smart historians to say, look, we have very low confidence that any of this is true. There's only a few key, uh, key things that um, New Testament historians agree on. I'm willing to be convinced one way or the other. You'll see, you'll see the reason I'm pressing you is this because, I mean, we know from Scripture that the pharaohs, the magicians, could produce miracles. In the end, Aaron could outproduce them. But I'm say, what I'm suggesting to you is even if the laws of nature can be suspended and, and great, great miracles can be performed, um, it doesn't prove the truth of the doctrine of the person who's, who's performing them. Or do um, you, would you not agree to that? Not necessarily. I think that's right. So somebody could be casting out devils from pigs and that wouldn't prove he was the son of God. I, I think that's right. In fact, there were Jewish exorcists. The only point that I was trying to make there was that this was illustrative of the kind of divine authority that Jesus claimed, especially since he didn't cast them out what if, yeah. in God's name, where he didn't perform miracles by praying to God. He would do them in his own authority so that Jesus exercised an authority that was simply unheard of at that time and for which he was eventually crucified. Unheard of at that time? He exercised an authority unheard of at that time? I kind of doubt that. I think there were many people at that time who uh, said that they're exer exercising the authority of a deity. Because it was thought to be blasphemous. Well, it was thought to be blasphemous to claim to be the Messiah, to be exact. I mean, the people who got the closest look at him, the Jewish Sanhedrin, were, were thought that he, his claims were not genuine. So remember, if you're resting anything on eyewitnesses, the ones who we definitely know were there uh, thought he was bogus. But, okay, I think I've got a rough idea. Assuming you make that assumption uh, uh, of his pre-existing divinity, that it's a pre-suppositionalist case, I can see what you're driving at. Well, no, I'm, I'm not, not a pre another question. No, I've got another question for you, which is this. How many religions in the world do you believe to be false? I don't know how many religions in the world there are, so I Well, could it. you name... <laughs> well, fair enough. I'll, I'll see if I can't narrow that down. I, <laughs> so, that was a clumsily asked question, I admit. Uh, do, you, are, do you regard any of the world's religions to Excuse be false? Excuse me? Do you regard any of the world's religions to be false preaching? Yes, yes, I think, yeah, certainly. Would you name one, then? Islam. Uh, that's quite a lot. Pardon me? That's quite a lot. Yes. Do you, therefore, do you think it's moral to preach false religion? No. So religion is responsible for quite a lot of wickedness in the world right there. Certainly. Right. I'd be happy to concede that. I, I would agree with that. So if I, was to be, if I was a baby being born in Saudi Arabia today, would you rather I was me or a Wahhabi Muslim? Would, would I be, you'd would rather you, be would you rather, would you rather it was me, it was an atheist baby, or um, a Wahhabi baby? <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have any uh, preferences to whether you would... As, as, as bad as that, okay. Uh, William Lane Craig just admitted that uh, preaching a, a false religion is an evil, immoral thing to do, yet he won't take a stand that he'd rather have someone be born into an atheist family versus a Muslim family. Because the, the atheist is not preaching a false religion, are they? Are there any, are there any, are there any, I mean, I must, I'm, I'm sorry, I must, I've only got a few seconds. It's a serious question. I shouldn't squander it. Are there any Christian denominations you regard as false? Certainly. Could I know what they are? Um, well, uh, I, I'm not a Calvinist. Notice Hitchens asks, is there any Christian religions that he deems as false? And he answers Calvinism. Does he regard as false? Certainly. Could I know what they are? Um, well, uh, I, I'm not a Calvinist, for example. I think that uh, certain tenets of Reformed theology are incorrect. I would be uh, more in the Wesleyan camp myself. But these are differences among brethren. These are not differences uh, on which we need to put one another in some sort of a cage. So within the Christian camp, there's a large diversity of perspectives. I'm sure there are views that I hold that are probably false. But I'm trying my best to, to get my... He says, I'm sure there's some views that I hold that are probably false. How would you figure that out, William Lane Craig? Which of your beliefs are false and which aren't? Do you have any system, any guides, any markers, any, um, any way at all for you to say, hmm, maybe 
no one saw the resurrected Bali Jesus. How would you figure that out if that happened to be the truth? My theology straight, trying to do the best job, but I think all of us would recognize that none of us agree on every point of Christian doctrine, on, on every uh, uh, dot and tittle. Before Mr. Hitchens succeeds in launching another series of religious wars among Christians, let's get to the... <laughs> Let's get to the responses, seven minutes or each, Dr. Craig. So the question I have to myself about that is why do you think Hitchens, or what, why do I think Hitchens asked that question about um, Dr. Craig? Uh, which religions, do you believe in false religions? Uh, which ones and why? Uh, are there any Christian religions or cults that you think are false and why? He's He's... Uh, with maybe he's not doing this uh, directly, but he's kind of hinting at the outsider test for faith there. Like, why do you think people believe in the same God you do, but have a completely different take on it? One that you would say yourself, William Lake Craig, is evil and is false uh, and is destructive. Why have this concept of God how can you be so confident in your view that you have the right belief? And, he, and William and Craig even admitted that he could be wrong on some of his beliefs. Why the confidence in yours when you admit that you don't believe all the other uh, various Christian sects and denominations, that they might be false or that they are false and your, yours isn't? Wouldn't you think, wouldn't you expect that if a God existed and really loved you, and really wanted people to know the truth, that he would make it clear to his creation. I think that is strong evidence that the, the beliefs are so varied amongst religions, and not only that, even within a religion, that pretty, pretty strong evidence that this is man made stuff. Okay, uh, Kev, if you're in the chat, come on in. Actually, let me uh, open up my appear. So we're going to talk about a survey that Cam did. And we're going to provide the results. I think we're probably pretty close to a thousand entries. It was a um, a critical reasoning test. Okay, I'm coming to appear. And we'll show the questions, hopefully, and show the results by religious affiliation or no religious affiliation. Let me get rid of this. And Hunter Bailey, welcome. Pine Creek, you're one of my favorite, one of your favorite Christians is here. Oh, is that you, Hunter Bailey? Are you my favorite Christian? <laughs> Hunter Bailey, what did you think of my comments about William Lane Craig? Did any of it resonate with you, make sense? Here comes Cam. How you doing, Cam? You're live. You're muted now. And All right. How are you? I would say I'm an eight. Oh, I'm a seven. <laughs> eight out of seven? No, eight out of ten. <laughs> no, I'm I'm a, a seven out of ten. Uh, you're a seven. I'm an eight. All right. So we're doing this. We're doing this. Okay. Uh, Give me the link in Facebook so I can um, put a, a screen share on here or something. All right. Uh, actually, first, first, give me the link to the to the test questions. I, oh, I think I have it here. Yeah, let's do that first. All right. Should we? And then um, should we explain the answers? Yeah, I, th I think once we've gone through. Um, Oh, yeah, let's talk about the answers before we talk about the results, maybe. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to show what the questions are, 
And how many people, do you know how many people took the test while I was live streaming? Um, it looks like maybe 30 something people. Oh, so did we get over a thousand? No, we didn't. We must be close though, right? 960. Oh. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to see your lovely face. <laughs> so let me... What kind of background have you given on it? I, well, why don't you uh, give background and if you repeat some of the things I said, that's okay because there's probably a lot of people who came in late. So it started really as something more out of interest. Um, these questions are not novel. They're questions that get asked in most uh, logic textbooks, as well as some of the research on psychology, in particular cognitive biases. So the questions aren't original to me in their structure, but at least I did come up with the particular formulation that you see in the in the quiz. Um, and what they're getting at is the um, two different things. One is logical reasoning and the other is probabilistic reasoning. And there's a few little like small little lessons in there that um, are somewhat debatable from by people. And I've had a number of people uh, argue with me <laughs> over whether or not the answers are what the answers are, but uh, I can defend it pretty well. And so I'm happy to if anybody wants to challenge it. Well, like. But like you said, the, a lot these questions are pretty standard and found in other textbooks. And so, if your wording is too ambiguous, then a lot of the wording in textbooks is ambi uh, in books is ambiguous as well. Then, yes, that's right. And but I I witnessed some of that stuff, uh, people f pushing back. And I think the whole thing is, it's that I don't want to be wrong. So it, That's can, right. it can't be my mistake. It must be the test giver's mistake. Yeah, at least one person, um, it, it felt like that was really what was going on with their objections. But um, fortunately, most people really enjoyed it. I got a lot of positive feedback. I got a lot of people saying how much fun they had doing it. One person even said that they were doing it with their partner and that they had so much fun that they asked me to make more of thing, <laughs> more of these things. Um, and I've talking, been talking with a, a person who actually teaches critical thinking at a university in Japan, and he um, is interested at some point in time, I won't mention his name, but at some point in time developing a more extensive um, quiz. Um, what I liked about this one is because it was only three questions, it had, a, I think it was more fun. Um, it was over quickly and you got the feedback quickly. It wasn't uh, onerous on, it wasn't difficult with your time. Did um, you, did you have any um, practical problems with the collection of the data? <laughs> Hmm. So initially, when I first published the uh, the quiz and started collecting responses, I had um, a particular feature in Google Forms turned off. Um, and this feature is to limit responses to one per person. And the way that uh, Google Forms does that is by requiring you to sign in. So I had that feature turned off because I wanted to lower the barrier of entry barrier of entry so people weren't put off um, submitting it. But then through the course of the submissions, as I was paying attention to them, I did notice some suspicious behavior on the part of um, one individual, in, well, at least what appears to be one individual in particular. Um, I don't know if you were suggesting I go into detail on that, Doug. But... No, no, I, I, I don't think you should go into detail that people would um, get it wrong and then re immediately retake the test and get it right. I don't want you to say anything like that. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's go through the... So, so anyway, the, the short of it is that after I started noticing uh, some abuse of, of it, in particular, some people who were quite clearly submitting it just like over and over again, um, I uh, then turned on the feature that made it. So you had to sign into Google, which is a bit of a bummer, but... Yeah. 
Okay, so why don't you go through the questions and uh, give the right answers. Sure thing. So question one here, the idea behind this is testing um, your ability to understand an argument, in particular its structure, um, its uh, logical structure. And so logically valid is this concept um, in logic <laughs> where uh, if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows. And so a question like this um, is difficult to answer because it's not really asking what you think it might be. Um, what you think it might be asking is which one sounds reasonable, which sounds like a kind of a reasonable argument or that it would have like a reasonable conclusion. And you can see at the first answer here, uh, if, the, if the moon is made of green cheese, then the sky is green. The moon is made of green cheese, therefore the sky is green. You can see with this that, I mean, we all know that the sky isn't green. <laughs> um, but the moon and, is made of green cheese. <laughs> and we all know that the, the moon isn't made of green cheese. And so it just sort of like, it, it feels wrong. Um, but if you look at the structure of it, it's actually using an inference rule called modus ponens, which is commonly used. And um, while the premises of this argument, in particular, the if condition, the if premise, and then the second premise that the moon is made of green cheese, while those things are both false, <laughs> um, the logical structure of the argument is valid. Yeah. And so, so modus ponens whereas, is basically if you have an if then statement, it works forwards, but not backwards. That's right. And so if we get to the second one here, it actually um, makes this error of which has come to be called affirming the consequent. The reason why it's called that is because the second part of the statement, the then uh, it is raining, it is raining. That part is called the consequent of the argument. Um, and the first part, the if the ground is wet, that's called the antecedent. But anyway, affirming the consequent is when your second premise asserts that the consequent of the first premise is true, and then you conclude uh, that the consequent is um, uh, sorry that the that the uh, antecedent is true, and so it's called affirming the consequent. But anyway, it's not logic. It's not a logically valid inference, um, and it's a it's a common fallacy that we fall prey to. And we're we're gonna uh, very soon after we go through these three questions, we're gonna show what percentage of people got the, the each question right or wrong, and um, and I think off the top of my head. Uh, still over half of the people who took the test got question one wrong but we'll look into that no it's more than half got it right but um but not by much right yeah it's not too much um but yeah we'll, we'll look into it okay. uh, but what i want to say is that like i just want to preface it is that like getting these questions wrong is not a bad thing like it's not i mean it means it means that you've made an error in judgment as you were answering the questions perhaps if you sat with it a lot longer you might reason it through um and it certainly doesn't imply anything about your intelligence or anything like that so if you're a participant out there who got the answers to the questions wrong <laughs> don't feel bad about it wait, you're in good company <laughs> wait a minute cam are you saying that if someone gets this first question wrong i should still interview them <laughs> um <laughs> I, I don't answer that. That's, 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 that's no, that, that no. On, to be put, to be perfectly honest, that's going to depend on whether or not they got at least one of the other ones right. Like, I think if they got all of them wrong, then maybe it might not be as good as another interview candidate. <laughs> but um, you know, if you had if you had an option between two people, uh, one person who got this first question right and one person who got this first question wrong, I would probably choose the person who got it right. Actually, um, if if you're a Christian listening right now either live or in the uh, replay sometime in the future if you got all three right and you call yourself a born again evangelical Christian or any type of Christian for that matter uh, email me please and I'll just by you getting four out of four it's more likely I'll interview you or three out of three so question number two yeah D just in terms of the scoring the third question I assigned two points instead of one point so but anyway yeah. so question two uh, which of the following is more probable? At least one God exists and our Earth is approximately spherical or 
at least one god exists. And the results in this one we'll get into a bit later. It was pretty mixed. Um, the The idea behind this question is uh, testing um, people's tendency to be bad at uh, performing conjunction, what's called conjunction in um, probabilities. So it's it's important to note that the question is not asking um, which of these is more reasonable. Uh, it's not asking, well, it's kind of asking that, but it's not asking uh, which of these statements is true. Uh, it's asking like which one is more probable. And there's yeah. this interesting things about probabilities where uh, when you take, if we start with a simple case of independent uh, probabilities, when you have uh, two statements and you're assigning a probability to each statement individually, when you try to figure out what the probability of both of those statements being true, uh, there's a particular rule in probability theory that says that you should multiply the probabilities together. And so, say, for example, uh, you go, Doug. I, I'm teaching my daughter, who's 15, uh, a lot of these things. And uh, there's a little uh, mnemonic device, mnemonic device. Mnemonic? Mnemonic. Mnemonic. Is it M or N? I don't know. It's got both letters in it. <laughs> yeah. <I think> Anyhow, so. <laughs> a little trick to use. And the trick is um, if you have a sentence uh, that contains the word and, A N D, you multiply because it spells the word am, A M. But if it has the word or in the claim or in the sentence, then you add the probabilities because. O and A doesn't spell anything, but A and M go together because it spells the word M. So anyhow, when you have and, multiply, or, add. Okay. So there's a lot Yeah, or, although we, we'll get into how it's not quite that simple. but um, Yeah, but for my 15-year-old, it works. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if we assume for the sake of argument that uh, the two statements in this first one are both independent of one another, that is at least one God existing, that statement being true uh, doesn't affect whether or not the earth is spherical or approximately spherical, then simply you multiply the probabilities together. But what's really interesting is that whenever you multiply these probabilities together, if they're less than one, or if any one of them is less than one, or in particular, if the earth being approximately spherical has a probability of less than one, then always it's going to be the case that that one when combined together has a lower probability because when you multiply something by a number that is less than one it always goes down so if you multiply 0.5 by one then it always goes down towards well sorry 0.5 by any number lower than one then it always goes down and um so is that clear enough doug uh, you're muted. Yeah, it's, it, I think it's clear. So basically, the more ands, the more th layers you add on to a claim, the least likely it's going to be if they're independent events uh, or claims. So yeah, looking at it in in full, you would say that the probability that at least one god exists has to be more than the compound or conjunction of at least one god exists and out of the spherical. Okay. Um, unless unless you think it's absolutely certain and there's no possible way that you could be wrong that the Earth is pro approximately spherical. But I think that that's being overconfident. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to give credence to the flat Earthers, but I, I think that if you can't imagine a way that you could be wrong about the shape of the Earth, then you're not thinking about it hard enough. <laughs> All right. So this final, this final question. This um, was the toughest I think one. That yeah, I think that this is the toughest one and the stats really bear this out. Um, so the background of it is quite important and um, each individual statement here um, is conveying very key information about the problem. So the first premise or the first statement is that uh, you have a population of chess subjects and 1% of them have cancer. And we're not talking about what type of cancer it is or anything like that. It's just we're just broadly talking about cancer. 
And then the second statement here, it tells you that if you're a person in the population that does have cancer and you and you're tested, you will always get a positive test result as opposed to a negative test result. The third statement here is telling you that when you're somebody who doesn't have cancer in this test population and you get given a test, there's a 1% chance that you will get a positive test result even though you don't have cancer. And then the last part here is that you're looking at a patient within this test population who hap happens to test positive. And... Uh, yeah, this is this is where a, a lot of people get things wrong. Um, how should we go about tackling this well, stuff? Uh, I like to keep things really simple. So let's say you uh, suck at math and you want to look at this intuitively. We know that 1% of the general population has this type of cancer. and But you're given new information that this person tested positive for cancer. So we have new information that should increase the probability of cancer. So that, I think, without doing any math... Your intuition should say the answer should not be 1%. That's right. So now you're left with 99 and 50. Now, this is, get, this is where it gets a little trickier. Now, I have a way that I think about it, um, but I do think about it in terms of odds. So I, I can give what will probably be a slightly more intuitive way than odds. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so it's, it's to imagine the following. Imagine that there's a room... And in that room are 10,000 people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of those 10,000 people, 100 of them have cancer, right? Because that's 1%. Yep. Is it, did I do the math correct? <laughs> yeah. But what, what, should we just say 100 people instead of 1,000? No, 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 no. It works out better if it's 10,000. So 10,000 10, 10, people. 10,000 or 1,000? No, 10,000. Yeah, 100 people. You're right. Yeah. And uh, so there's this 100 people within this population of 10,000 in a room that have cancer. And that means that there's 9,900 that don't, right? Right. Okay. So everybody is given a test. Imagine just hypothetically, everybody's given a test. This cancer and test. This cancer test. And what's going to happen is that every one of those 100 people who got the test, what's their result going to be? It's going to be that they tested positive for that cancer because they that's have right, that cancer. That's, well, but also that's what the problem state is that there's no false, uh, there's no uh, like false negatives or yeah, yeah, that, false that, negatives. That confuses people. Just say anybody who has cancer, which is 100 of them, We'll test positive. They always test positive. They always test positive. Yeah. But of the other group, the 9,900, all of those people are also given the test. And what did what test result did they receive? Well, 1% of that 9,900, they got a positive result, right? right? Because we said that when a case patient doesn't have cancer, that's the 9,900 group. They test positive 1% of the time. So that's, 99. it ends up being 99. So what ends up happening is if you remove all of the other people from the room who don't test positive, so they got a negative test, and you just leave the people in the room that tested positive, you have 100 of them who tested positive and they have cancer, and 99 of them that tested positive and they don't have cancer. So if you pluck any one individual out of that room, at what random. are the odds at random? What are the odds that one of those individuals will have cancer? And be. of course, it's going to be around 50 50, right? Because right. you've got 100 versus 99. That's if you do uh, 100 divided by 100 plus 99, it's effectively like 100 over 200 and 50 50. It's slightly more than that. Um, but ever so slightly, it's almost 50 50. This is, uh, this, this is the way I, I described it to my daughter. So basically, you can have cancer or no cancer. Now, what do we know before we do any testing? What do we know? We know if we had 100 people, 
there would be one, um, one person with cancer, 99 with not. But now we get new information. The information is that we have 100% of the people who test, who take this test, who have cancer, will test positive, 100%. But of the people with no cancer, 1% will test. I shouldn't, do, I shouldn't do it that way. No, it's 1%. All you have to do is multiply these two things. 1 times 100 is 100. 99 times 1 is 99. So imagine this as people. 100 people have cancer, 99 don't. So what's the odds someone will have test positive and have cancer? Well, it's going to be 100 divided by all the people, 199, 100 plus 99. I don't know if that helps people, but which is roughly 50%. So when I actually saw this problem that you gave, this is exactly how I did it. Because I, I don't t trust my intuitions. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think that there's like a really easy way to figure it out in your head that's pretty similar to this. Um, you... You take the one number, 100%, and then you divide it by the other number, which is uh, 1%, which the way that you would do that is you would go 1 divided by 0. Um, well, yeah, 1 divided by 0 0.01. And that gives you this thing called a likelihood ratio. And then all you do is convert the initial probability into odds form and then multiply the likelihood ratio by the left-hand side, and that gives you your your posterior odds. And, like, I'm not saying it's easier, like, it, I'm not saying it's easier because it's less intuitive. Like, you're not thinking through, like, a way in which this problem is being played out in real life, but it's mathematically easy to perform that calculation. Okay, send, um, me, send me the link to the, the spreadsheet. Okay. Or, or just so, uh, yeah, no, the, I prefer the spreadsheet. Yeah. Uh, um, but what I wanted to talk about here before going on to the, to the results is that what you can see in this question is that the final probability depends very sensitively on those initial inputs. So for example, if it were the case that in the population only 0.001% of people had cancer, that is like 0.001, it's like one in 10,000, or sorry, yeah, one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, something like that. If, if, if it, the odds were that low, then you can see that from this test, it's not really going to raise your probability to a very high level. So even though somebody tests positive, because of the fact that there's this false positive rate of 1%, when you multiply that 1% by the population that doesn't have cancer, Answer, it still ends up being a really, really large number of people who test positive but don't actually have cancer. And um, this is like a critical part of thinking about the way the world works. And it really relates to when you're assessing claims that are really improbable. So uh, I don't know if you want to go very deep in this, Doug, but... Like the idea is that like if somebody claims to you something that is very, very um, rare, um, like it seems you just like on face value, it's just like, wow, that's like not something that like I know. And as an example would be um, maybe a friend of yours owning a nuclear weapon. It's incredibly rare for individual people in a population to own a nuclear weapon. So rare that I actually think there's probably very few, if it, any examples at all, of an individual well, this owning is, such a weapon. I, I actually want to apply this to the resurrection uh, in a bit, but we'll go into the results. And maybe, yeah. maybe you don't want me to do that, but <laughs> but this is why. Well, yeah, let's, let's do the results. Okay, so uh, uh, we had 961 people responded to this and this was issued on january 14th i think right cam so in three, yeah that sounds right so and where why is it mostly atheists it's because um cam and i are probably more active on facebook groups in atheism which was posted people probably know cam and i better in those groups so maybe they're more willing to maybe participate i don't know 
but we did put this in as many in fact i even tried to put it in answers in genesis but it didn't work um so we did try to put it in a diverse range of groups uh, christian groups and theist groups whatever we could think of and atheist groups and atheist groups and so uh the vast majority were and I also posted it in Muslim groups and Hindu groups and um, yeah, I, I tried to like get a broad range of, of perspectives. And the other includes um, Jews. Yeah, those are the Jews, Hindus, uh, pantheists, polytheists. What else? I'm, I'll, I'll show you later. But anyhow, uh, let me bring up the, uh, the hardcore results here. Should we make let people predict what they? <laughs> no. <laughs> Did you have any predictions what would happen for the results? Um, I mean, I it would be wrong for me to say because I didn't tell anybody ahead of time, but I did think that there would be differences based on um, the demographics, but I didn't think that they would be very strong. Well, my prediction was that everybody would do poorly. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I thought that too. So the the research of folks like Daniel Kahneman and Tversky and all of the other people involved in the psychological research of heuristics and biases, they provide a lot of background information that demonstrates that the following few things are common problems in reasoning. Uh, which were being tested in this particular case. One of them is like the ability to understand logical validity and, and arguments, um, logical syllogisms. The other is the ability to understand what's called conjunction and probability, which has come to be the inability to understand it has come to be called a conjunction fallacy. And then the final thing is the inability to understand how base rates affect outcomes of uh, statistical testing. And this has come to be called base rate fallacy or base rate neglect. And all of those three things have been studied extensively in the psychological literature. So pr going into this, we had like a pretty good background knowledge suggesting that a lot of people were going to get these things wrong um, because that they just do. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like naturalists had the highest score, but there's only 25 of them. Basically, anything below 30, you know, statistically, they say 30 is the minimum you need for a representative population sample, but even that's probably way too low. So a naturalist got, on average, three out of the four questions right. Remember, there's only three questions, but the last question was so difficult, we scored it as worth two. So out of four, a naturalist averaged three. Second place was the atheists, 2.06. Then we have uh, Christians, 1.9. Um, yeah, Muslims got 1.68. So other was 1.77 and prefer not to answer was was the same. So yeah. and those are both above Muslim. But like Doug said, like, you know, when if you're seeing here these totals, we're getting like there's almost no way to tell anything about a population from asking two pantheists <laughs> to, <laughs> to answer. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like no point in even sharing it, but... So what this number of 1.55 is, is basically the, the average of each category. But since so, so many categories had very few responses, I took the weighted average here, uh, which is 1.97, which is a failing grade. <clears throat> so out of 961 people, on average, people failed. Uh, question number one, so I would just look at these numbers, the weighted average. Question, question number one, 71% got right approximately, which is basically the one, uh, if the moon is made of green cheese, then what is it? The sky is green. Then the sky is green. Yeah, the, the moon is made of green cheese, therefore the sky is green. That is uh, the, That was the correct answer. Question two was, uh, God exists and the earth is a sphere, or God exists, which one is more probable, which is more likely? The correct answer was that just God exists. Uh, and just over half, which is, 
it's pretty close to just guessing that one. Yeah. And, but this one, um, only 34% got it. Real well, and something to note here, which I think is really important is that the, um, uh, the percent here, I think is going to depend sensitively on the number of options available in the quiz. And the first two questions, they only had two options available. So if you think of it, just like you're flipping a coin and, um, using that in order to answer the survey, there should be like a, around about 50% chance that you're going to um, get it right. Um, whereas on the final question, we're looking at three different options that were made available to answer. So a 33% would be what the chance result was. And what we're seeing here is the weighted average is like slightly above chance. Yeah. And my cousin Leon made a good point. Uh, he noticed naturalists scored the highest and his point was, well, you have to be pretty bright to even know what a naturalist is. <laughs> and and so... It kind um, of skews the... Yeah, um... it's, it's a bit of a, a biased uh, selection there. But, but you decided to go with all these various categories so you could um, just cause more problems in tabulating? <laughs> or... <laughs> Um, I think at the time I was making it, I was trying to be comprehensive. I mean, obviously this isn't comprehensive. One category that I missed that I actually would consider to be a separate category from all is agnostic. And I never sent this survey to my friend, Steve McRae, because I think he would have wanted to crucify me <laughs> as a result of it. <laughs> but um but i do see agnostics as being like a genuinely distinct category and i suspect that many of the people who fall into the other category are actually agnostics did you have an agnostic drop down box cat option no no i didn't and Not this is the thing is that i mean a lot of atheists consider uh, agnostic and atheism to be uh things that aren't mutually exclusive so um, you can use agnostic as like a modifier, right. which pertains to a knowledge claim about either theism or atheism. Um, but within the like philosophical literature, it's not really used that way that commonly. Um, well, everybody usually... knows that everybody knows that agnostics are functional atheists anyhow. Functionally, functionally, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I want to relate this to why this matters uh, and some practical examples for things I do on my channel. Let me uh, make me bigger here and raise me up. Do you want to, do you want to be on the bottom or top? No. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the bottom. So for example, when I'm talking to, to theists about the Kalam cosmological argument and I hear them say, well, the God is, is the creator God who's the first cause. And then they start adding things like disembodied minds and omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and outside of time. You notice how I'm using the word and over and over. This is similar to Cam's question about what's more probable, that a God exists or that a God exists and the earth is a sphere. Now, the, the Christian might say that these are dependent events, not independent events, but what do you think I'm right to say if you once you start layering on more and more claims that the probability that this god exists overall decreases does it not are you asking me i mean i i think that yeah like when you have like a really complex theory that has lots of working parts it does require um i, I think it does require that theory to have uh I mean, I think it lowers your prior assessment of it being true, but importantly, it like raises the bar of the type of evidence that you need to be able to, um, to you know, believe it. Oh, someone in the chat asked, can I group the data from theist to non-theist or believers to non-believers? And I kind of already did that. And it was the average score of atheists or naturalists or non-believers was 2.5 and the average score of theists hindus is islam muslims christian uh buddhist polytheists was 1.44 
Although that's, yeah, that's difficult to, because it seems like the naturalist category is probably impacting that assessment quite a bit because that's um, the, nat the naturalist was like way above the, it was almost a whole point above the you're right. other it's, top score. You're right. It's not, uh, that's not weighted average. Um, but yeah. So getting back to how this could apply to some of my interviews. So things like the cosmological argument. Yeah. I think once you start layering on different attributes, different claims about the deity, the overall probability goes down. Like I've heard a lot of Christians say, well, Doug, even if it's 50, 50, um, you know, you, you shouldn't be so quick to say you don't believe that no God exists because it's 50, 50, right? And, but it's deeper than that because the claims that most people make, most, not all, but most people make claims about their God that are so convoluted and have so many and statements to their claims that not only do you have to believe this God is a creator God, but is outside of time, is part of his nature and has a mind and is personal, that's part of his nature. And you got to keep stuffing things into the claim. Well, yeah, and I think that uh, taking it off of like, you know, such a metaphysical proposition as God's existing and moving it on to something a little bit more practical, like a question about history, uh, what we do um, as humans, I think that we're quite a storytelling spe species and uh, we, I think, are uh, more readily convinced by um, things presented to us in a storytelling narrative. Um, we tell stories about ourselves, and we obviously tell stories about the past. Um, but when you have like a historical claim, the more bits and pieces that you add on to that historical claim, so for example, if we're looking at something in the Gospels and we're considering, uh, you know, Jesus, he uh, not only did he, you know, multiply lows, but he also walked on water and he also uh, like had uh, a special uh, transfiguration and all of these extra details that we add on to it, it's important to notice how uh, in the absence of strong evidence supporting those things independently, we actually see the probability of all of them being true and taken together going down. So for a biblical literalist who wants to maintain that everything in the Bible is true, it's important to note that you're actually really like you're adopting a very high burden for yourself there on the basis of that okay and this is yeah i agree with with what you said there but this is how i would apply question three which is the question of the cancer patients and just like i had um cancer or no cancer we can go resurrection or no resurrection And just like we had prior probabilities of what percentage of the general population has cancer, and in that case it was 1%, what percentage of people who die stay dead? <laughs> it's pretty high, right? Or another question, which is, I think, very similar, is how often does God have the desire assuming that God exists, how often does God have the desire to raise humans from the dead, you know, at particular points in history? Okay, so let's say, uh, assuming that God exists, the, uh, if we look at the billions of people on the planet who have existed, let's, let's be really generous and say uh, our prior is that 1% uh, of people actually resurrect, which is, of course, way too high. And 99% um, and of people who die stay dead. Even, you know, God exists and could raise them, but 99% of the time, he, God chooses not to raise them from the dead. Okay, now we can start looking at the, at the evidence one by one. And so what's, what's the biggest, uh, strongest evidence that Christians say for the resurrection? They'll go to the minimal facts, which is like four pieces of evidence, but if we were to take one of, one of them at a time, probably the, um, 
No, they don't use the empty tomb I think, anymore. I they? think the resurrection appearances are the things that they think are most important. Okay, so resurrection appearances. I mean, assuming we all agree that Jesus existed and that he died and was crucified and things. Uh, so what? So just like the cancer situation, we have this test. The test is uh, whether or not you have cancer. And 100% of the time, if you do have cancer, the test will be positive. So what would be the po the test here? The test is that if Jesus did like hundred, yeah, yeah, you can. If Jesus did rise from the dead, 100% of the time, people would report that or see that, or some of them would see it. Whoever saw it would say so. Is that accurate? Is that yeah, and may maybe we could just focus in, um, like you mentioned earlier in the stream, how within the New Testament literature, we really only have one first-hand person claiming to have seen um, a vision of a resurrected Jesus. But would I be safe to say that whoever did see, even though it was only Paul in the New Testament who first person said it, that 100% yeah. of the time that they would be right, that they saw yep. If, if Jesus actually did rise from the dead and Paul saw it, that that test would be positive that he saw it. <laughs> now, what percentage of the people who take the test that they saw a resurrected person are mistaken or wrong or lying, fibbing, telling a story? So all the ways in which it um, is the case that they didn't really have a veridical experience of Jesus. That is one that really was a resurrected Jesus, but they would say that they did anyway, you know, and of course there are many, many ways in which this could happen. Um, delusions and hallucinations and lying and. Um, right. So let's say out of all the people that have ever existed on the planet, what percentage of them have, who made the claim that they saw someone rise from the dead, what percentage of them were actually wrong for whatever reason? Hallucination, fibbing, lying, just mistaken, crazy, uh, schizophrenic, delusional. Well, if we look into the literature on uh, loved ones who have passed away, we actually find that it's quite common for people to claim to have seen a loved one after they died. So let's say 99%. We'll, we'll give the benefit of the doubt that 1% are actually who claimed to have seen someone rise from the dead actually were correct. They actually did see something external to themselves, a person rise from the dead. So just like I did with the cancer one, just view these as people and multiply down. Prior probability of someone rise from the dead, 1%, 99% of people who die stay dead. 100% of people who witness someone who's actually risen from the dead will report that they saw that. I mean, sorry, to stop you here, I mean, I think that like people would thoroughly dispute the 99 percent thing that you just said there but anyway <laughs> what meaning that it's too low no they uh sorry that no that it's way way too high like christians which, would try which one christian this 99, this 99 the top one or the bottom one the the bottom one i mean of course like uh most like uh both Christians and non-Christians would say that the prior probability here of resurrection 1% was way too high, but they would also say that this 99%, the second one that you have here, that that's way too high too. Because really what th what that's saying is like, if it is the case that somebody doesn't, didn't resurrect, there's a 99% chance that they would say that somebody did. Okay, so what do you think is a better number? Um, I mean, I, th I think that like, it's, it's difficult to say a number for that, but m what my point, it, um, I think you would have to really, really work it through. Um, but I think that the literature showing that people claim to have seen loved ones after they die, um, is definitely like a body of evidence that tells us that like it's it's very common uh for people so say for example um maybe in the population maybe five percent of the time Sold. that's a loved one dies 
they say they have an experience and they claim to have had an experience of their loved one after they died. Uh, so 5% of the population claim that they've seen uh, a resurrected loved one. Okay. So when we multiply 99 times 5... If you if you're interested in looking at the literature on this, I don't know if the five percent value is right, but like grief visions is one of the key terms that you would look for if you're doing a literature search. So what we have here is we have four hundred ninety five people, four hundred and ninety five people who claim to have seen a resurrected body, but are mistaken because there is no resurrection. This is in the no no resurrection column, and we have a hundred people where there was actual resurrection, that's the truth, and 100 people reported it. They saw it. So even of these very generous numbers, the probability of a resurrection would be 100 over the total people, 595. I hope, uh, I hope Tim McGrew is watching this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, though, is that Tim McGrew argues that this, like, we're summarizing Tim McGrew's argument using these the second set of numbers, the 100% and the 5%. Tim McGrew would actually tell you that he thinks that when you take those things in a ratio to one another, he would say it favors resurrection by, like, 10 to the power of like 39 or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the value is, but it's like, it, it's like a uh, 10 multiple, like it's got like 39 zeros after it. And so he would say that even if it were the, it, like if you were being so generous to say that the probability of a resurrection is 1%, we should be almost certain uh, that Jesus rose from the dead on the basis of the evidence that Tim thinks that he has from the New Testament. So I think that your setup here, like, greatly... Um, it, by the way, Doug and I didn't, like, talk about this ahead of time, like, at all. <laughs> um, but I think your setup here, Doug, like, greatly... Uh, it puts you on the back foot in, an, in a discussion with Tim McGrew. Because if the type of uh, likelihood ratio you're arguing for is the one that you just wrote down on the paper, then Tim McGrew uh, would not only dispute that, but he would also say that if you assume the probability of resurrection was 1%, you should become a believer, Doug. <laughs> That's what he would say to you. Like, on the basis of the the probabilities that he argues for, um, the likelihood ratio in particular, he would say, oh, you should become a Christian. You should become a Christian Well, right no, now. no. He, he could say you should become a believer in resurrections, but not necessarily a Christian one believer. Yeah, I mean, I think he takes that to be... Um, well, no, because, like, the second column was, for example, Paul's resurrection appearances. But anyway... If we really want to talk about Tim McGrew's argument, he includes a lot of things from the Gospels um, as part of his um, argument. But each thing that a guy like Tim McGrew would include from the Gospels, we could run each individual analysis like this. Like, what's the probability that um, there was a guy named Mark who was an associate of Peter who accurately wrote things down, you know— What's the probability that there was mistakes and that it wasn't actually Mark and blah, 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 blah. And it just becomes a huge mess of of low probabilities multiplied by low probabilities, does it not? Well, he would argue that it becomes a, glorif a glorifying conjunction of uh, of what he would call like a like likelihood ratios or consequent probabilities that each individually stack up to make really powerful evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. It's like we get all these bankrupt companies and put them in one big pool, one big vat and stir them together, and we get one profitable company out of it. It's like, I think that's a great analogy, by the way. That's basically how I view it. Right, but I think the logic of Tim McGrew's argument is actually correct. The problem is, is that his assessment of the evidence is incredibly flawed. For example, I mean, I mean we, we probably shouldn't go into it. Yeah, um, so my last question to you is, um, so based on these results, 
Are you saying atheists are smarter than Christians? Oh, goodness, no. No, no way. <laughs> I, in fact, I don't think really you can infer anything from these scores. I mean, the only thing that you can infer is on the basis of the population that I surveyed, uh, who, uh, of those subpopulations, you know, who got the answer right on each individual question. <laughs> and I think that beyond that, you can't infer anything. It's like, it's just like, the only thing that you can infer is what the data is directly stating, like that atheists happen to get 60, uh, 56% of question one right. <laughs> And and they have, uh, sorry, 75, me, I, 76. I read 75. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was looking at the, the overall. Well, what I think the safe thing to infer from all this is that uh, we could all do better with our critical uh, reasoning abilities. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, the fact that that question three lines up almost directly with chance is pretty concerning. <laughs> yeah. Because I think that that's like the best question out of all of them is the one that teaches you how to recognize how um, the likelihood of something on your background knowledge affects like how your evidence changes um, your final belief. Okay. Uh, any final thoughts? I'm going to start the music, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, tell them the new study you're doing. Or do you don't want to? Oh, I mean, I can talk about it, but it's not. It's hard to tell whether or not it's going to come, come to anything. But a f friend and I are working on developing questions to survey... Uh, New Testament scholars and the general public we're providing like the, we're going to be providing the ability well not the general public but like people who are non-scholars but super interested um, the, the idea is to ask them questions about uh, common problems or common uh, you know hypotheses in New Testament criticism and then survey the field and it's going to be difficult to get this out to a lot of New Testament scholars, but what we're hoping is that uh, we will be able to get a few people on board and they'll share it with their colleagues and things like this. Let's, let's get this database, bigger than Gary Habermas's, public, available for all to see, and put Habermas out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I, well, I do really don't like the methodology that he used um I, yeah <laughs> it'd be nice to see a publicly available assessment of a representative sample of new testament historians and what they really think about the state of the evidence of um, of the new testament and so if you're if you want any more information um you can ask me about it through facebook uh, if you want to be involved at all with designing the questions, feel free to hit me up and make some suggestions. Currently, I have covered all of the basics and the types of questions you would find in an introduction to the New Testament. And, um, yeah. And I want to apologize to William Lane Craig. He was scheduled to come on tonight to defend himself with that uh, debate that we went over, but he, we ran out of time. So sorry to William Lane Craig that we couldn't fit him in. Sorry, Billy Boy. Maybe next time. Poof or drown, Cam. Poof or drown. <laughs> Definitely poof for me. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not just talking about myself. <laughs> poof for me as well. Good night, everyone. Thank you for uh, hanging out. Really appreciate the donations. See you next time.